Good morning. Welcome uh, to the fourth lecture on uh, model checking. Uh, the topic of today, Dutch King Day, perhaps not known to you, but uh, um, is uh, again parallelism and communication. In particular, I'm going to talk about channel systems. But before I do this, I first uh, would like to announce that uh, the questionnaire that was sent around via the L2P system about the date of the exam, uh, the vast majority is uh, in favor of sticking to the, old, uh, to the original date. So we have decided to, stay, to stick to that date, which is the 31st of August. Now, I know that a few students um, have severe problems on the 31st. And severe means doesn't mean you're on holidays. Uh, it means you either go for, uh, let's say, studying a semester abroad, you're an Erasmus student, and you're leaving Aachen before the 31st. If this is the case, please send us an email with your name, matricle number, and then we will try to find an arrangement so that you can do an exam before the 31st. Okay, so only those people that are really cannot make it on the 31st for good reasons. And I also would like to know those reasons. Yeah. So being on Hawaii for holidays doesn't count. Okay. Um, so what we have seen in the previous lectures is uh, uh, basically about uh, models. And uh, the kind of models we have seen so far were things like uh, program graphs, which are used as representation for sequential programs. We have seen uh, sequential hardware circuits. And um, in the previous lecture, we have seen uh, several operators for uh, modeling uh, multi-threading. Or parallelism. And there, what we have seen is basically three operations. We have seen interleaving, which was denoted by this triple bar, where the idea was that you have two threads and or more, but they can execute their actions uh, autonomously, so there was no communication. We have seen something what we called handshaking. This was uh, defined like this, a double arrow, and then as a, uh, it has as argument a set of actions. We call them synchronization actions. And the intuition is that all actions in the set sin need to be synchronized. That means if you have two processes running in parallel, they both have to be in a state where they can do such an action. And then if they take such an action, they do this simultaneously. So in effect, this is nothing else than this operation with the empty set. And, um, what we are going to see, uh, and what we also have seen, is uh, shared variables. Where I define this operation not on the transition system level, but at the program graph level. Today, we're going to bring these things together. And uh, that means, uh, basically, we're going to introduce you a model that covers basically interleaving, handshaking, as well as shared variables. And this is called channel systems. And why are channel systems of interest? At the end of the lecture, I'm going to show you that actually the model that I'm going to introduce today is basically the model which is the input language Promola. And this is the input language of spin. And spin is the I would say the most uh, popular model checker uh, developed by Holtzman. I mentioned this in the first lecture. Holtzman got the SIG soft, I mean, uh, software award from ACM for developing this, uh, this uh, model checker. 
And in order to, let's say, uh, provide the models to that model checker, um, this model checker provides you with the input language Promola. And this is nothing else, as we're going to see at the end, a syntactic sugar for channel systems. OK, so the model that we're going to introduce today, um, and that's also be the last lecture that is about models. The next lecture will be about properties. Um, that ends today with uh, these uh, channel systems. So what we have is we have uh, parallel systems. They can depend on data. They have means to use shared variables, uh, which is one way as a kind of a simple way to communicate. They can have synchronous message passing, handshaking, as well as, and that's new for you today, asynchronous message passing. So let me uh, uh, intuitively explain you what is asynchronous message passing. And I'd like to stress this A. So in handshaking, which is synchronous, it really means that all partners have to be in a state and then they simultaneously, synchronously evolve. In asynchronous, you still have communication, but the sender and receiver are not obliged to move simultaneously. The sender can first send the message and at some point later, the receiver can basically get the message out of his or her mailbox and then read it and based on that performs a certain transition in its own transition system. So simply uh, you can view it like this. Uh, you have a sender and think of this as, a, as an automaton, right? So we have a transition system or an automaton um, that evolves. Actually we're going to describe this by a program graph. And then we have a receiver which is also described by a program graph. Yeah, so these are program graphs. Program graphs are finite, right? Because uh, every program has finitely many uh, lines or states and locations as we call them. This is a program graph. And now the question is how do they communicate? Well, there are two ways. Either they have some shared variables. Uh, that could be, for instance, something like x and y. And this x can be used by, for instance, saying here x becomes a certain value. Or maybe x is used here by saying this edge is enabled so that if x is larger than zero, uh, you can do a certain action. That's the way we already have seen shared variables. But this new thing is by means of buffers. So that means there is a buffer here. So this is a five-fold buffer. First in, first out. This has several places. And it means that the sender can send the message to the receiver. What does that mean? Um, suppose that this already is occupied, that one is occupied. And suppose here this, we send the message, uh, let's say, A. Then on sending this message, this A is put into this buffer. Yeah, so this means send A. No, and then you can imagine that someone later, the receiver, if the receiver has already deleted those two messages, has already received those messages from its mailbox, it can then receive message A. Okay, so the buffer is a kind of delay Right? If the buffer size is zero, then it is identical to synchronous communication. If the buffer size is strictly larger than zero, then you have this kind of delay. And this channel you also have in the other direction. So there is a channel that goes in this direction. And that means that maybe this process can only send messages here and that process can receive it. Yeah? So that's basically the model that we're going to consider. <laughs> Good, and we call those buffers channels. Good, so here is the ID. We, in this case, we have four processes. We have channels between these processes. For instance, C3 is a channel between P3 and P1. Uh, C1 is a channel between P1 and P2, and C2 is a channel between two P2 and C1 and P1. And you have shared variables. Um, the channels are first in, first out. 
unless they have capacity zero, then we have the same principle as with handshaking, then the receiver and the sender have to move simultaneously. Question? Uh, why are there are two channels between P1 and P2? In both directions, one. So a channel is directed, like I indicated here. This is a kind of directed channel. This one is allowed to send here. That one is allowed to receive, but not the other way around. It's not the case that this receiver can also put messages there, which are intended for this. It really is in one direction, a channel. Good. Now, this 5-4 buffer can have a certain capacity. So here is uh, another example where you see that uh, there is a channel of capacity 2 that goes from P3 to P1. And there is the capacity 1 between of, of a channel that goes from P2 to P1, for instance. The capacity can also be unbounded. Then it simply means that uh, an unbounded number of messages can be kept into the buffer. OK. So I mentioned already, synchronous message passing is the same as having capacity zero. Asynchronous, where A means there might be a delay between sending and receiving, means that the capacity is strictly positive. Good, so how are we going to formalize this? First, we're going to formalize this by means of program graphs. This will be a program graph. That will be a program graph. This is a simple example where I only have two processes. In general, I can have n processes, so I have n program graphs, p1 to pn. Now we have transitions, so we use program graphs as before. So that means they go from a location to another location. Such an edge is guarded with a guard g, which again is a kind of Boolean condition over the variables, like here, x is larger than 0. And we have an action alpha that tells you what is going to be performed. For instance, an assignment to one of the shared variables. And we're going to add two more ingredients. So these are the two new features that were not available in the program graph. Why do I need them? Because I want to have this possibility to send a message, and I want the possibility to, to retrieve a message from the buffer. And we're going to do this as follows. So C exclamation mark V. First of all, there is no guard. So the guard implicitly is true, but as default, we are going to omit this. This means that this program graph can evolve from Li to L prime i by, on channel C, inserting the value V. So V is a value, right? 27, the string Aken. This is put into the message buffer. And C is a directed channel from a certain program to another program. Then we can also retrieve messages from the buffer. This is indicated by C question mark X. What does that mean? Well, the intuitive interpretation is, suppose that this program is in the location LI. Then it's going to check in channel C whether there is a message available. It takes the first message. I mean, it's a FIFO buffer, so it takes the message which is at the head of the buffer. It does not go into traverse the buffer and try to see, hey, is there any message that I like? Like a love letter of your neighbor? No, you take the first message which is in the buffer, and that's what you take, and you assign it to the variable x. So that's a value which you retrieve from the channel, and you assign it to the variable x. And of course, I'm assuming that everything is type correct. So if x is an integer variable, then the channel carries integers. If x is a string, then the channel carries strings. Good. So what we have is we have type variables, variables with a certain uh, domain, DOM of x. And as I remembered before, like for program graphs, we have an evaluation for those variables, which were, I just remind you, it's a function that maps variables to values. And we use this Greek et eta for this. So we're assuming that the value of variable x is a value which is type consistent with the, let's say, the type of x. And that means, in my terminology, that this is a member of the domain of x. Good. So now we have channels. Channels have typed. That means they carry messages of a certain type. 
and they have a capacity. So a channel C has a capacity C which is either bounded, a natural number, zero or more, or it is unbounded, and that means the capacity is infinite. Every channel has, like an ordinary variable, a, a type, and this type is given by the domain of that channel. That's simply the type of the messages it can carry, so to speak. And then there is an evaluation, like I have an evaluation of variables, I also have an evaluation of channels. Now what does a channel carry? Now look at this, here I have one, two, three messages. So the value of a channel is a sequence, this one, that one, that one, right? And also I would like to keep the ordering, remember, because I would like to model a first in, first out buffer. So it's not a set, it's not a back, I model this as a sequence. So that means that I have a mapping, Xi, that maps a channel to actually uh, a finite word, and this finite word is a finite uh, word of values that the current channel is carrying. And this is the word of the length which is at most the capacity, right? So if this is uh, something of the form uh, yeah, AAC, then uh, the channel contains values, and if this channel is uh, Chan, then the current value Xi of this channel is then indeed the sequence CAA. Yeah, this is the first uh, element, the second and the third element. And of course the length of this word cannot exceed the capacity of the channel. So, formally, a channel system is a set of, a finite set of program graphs, P1 to Pn, and I'm using this notation. Um, and they are defined over a set of shared variables. So I'm going to define what are the variables that these graphs uh, apply to. And I have to indicate which channels are there. And that's the set Chan. So var is a set of type variables, and Chan are those type channels. Now what is a program graph? A program graph is as before. So that's the same as before, that means we have locations, actions, this is describing what's the effect of an action on the shared variables, and now also in some way on the channels. Uh, we have this uh, uh, edge relation, some initial location and some initial condition. We have the same guarded commands as before, where G is a, a Boolean condition over the variables, and we have actions in the set of, the set of actions of program graph I. Now we have sending a value via a channel. So program graph i, so the i component in my system, can have an edge, that's what the subscript i means, can have an edge from L to L prime, and apparently this program sends over channel C the value v. Of course this is assuming that C now is a channel where pi is able to send a message to. And you can receive a value, which is indicated by this question mark x. Good. So let us describe a little bit more in detail what this channel system exactly does. So I'm going to consider here first the capacity is positive. That means this is really the kind of mailbox ID. Someone puts something in the mailbox and a process somewhat later retrieves the message from the mailbox. So we have the two actions we just have seen. First we have to see when are those actions enabled. The guard is always true, so this enabledness does not depend on the guard, it only depends on the status of the channel. And here I'm going to describe shortly the effect and that's what we're going to formalize later. So the idea is that you can send a message only, of course, if the channel is not full. Yeah? If the capacity of the channel is free, if the, mess the channel already carries three messages, it's not possible to put in another message that would be something like a buffer overflow. So that means this action is only enabled if the channel is not full. What will be the effect? Well, the effect that I just have explained, if this is the current channel content, where this is the head of the channel, right, then we're going to add a new message, namely the, the value v is going to be appended to the content, that means the head of the channel is t still v1, and this new value v is appended at the end of the channel. 
Notice that here the ordering is the reverse ordering as I drew here, right? Here is the head of the channel, and here you append it at the end of the channel. Good. What happens if a program is in a location it wants to send, but the channel is full? It simply means if there is no other possibility this program graph can do, this program simply is blocked at that point. It has to wait until the, at least there is a vacant place in the channel. So what about receiving? Of course, you can only receive a message if there is something in your mailbox. So you can receive if the channel C is not empty. Let's suppose that V is the message which is in the front of the of the or mailbox, so that's the, let's say, the oldest message which is still there, so that's the head of the buffer. Then what's the effect of doing this action? The effect is that you're basically going to assign to the variable x, because that's the variable indicated here, the value v, because v is the front of the buffer, and we're going to remove v from the buffer, and that's indicated as follows. If this is the current state of the buffer before doing the action C question mark X. So I'm assuming here that there is at least one message. So R is strictly positive. Then what we're going to do is, uh, uh, this was the one where we put the message. I have to look at this, right? I mean, V is the front of the buffer, sorry. Here is the rest of the message. I'm going to receive this message to X. What does that mean? I'm going to delete this element from the buffer. That's what you see here, because this pointer is basically now to this head of the buffer and I have assigned the value v to the variable x, which was exactly the variable I was using in this statement. Okay? So you can see this as a kind of assignment. You assign x, I mean v to x, but it's a kind of distributed assignment, right? Because someone has put this v in the buffer, the receiver does an assignment to x, but the value it's going to assign has been determined by the sender. Good. If the capacity is zero, then actually that means that you have to execute those two actions. Now I'm pushing the wrong button. Uh, those two actions at the same time. Intuitively speaking, the buffer has no capacity to store a message. That means if a sender sends a message, it can only be received if the receiver is able to receive it now in the current location. The effect is then really a distributed assignment you assign to x the value v. Good. Are there any questions so far? The channels, are they bound to the program graph? The channels are bounded to the program graph. Yeah, the channels are part of the definition of the program graph. The program graph has variables as well as channels, and there is indicated who is allowed to send to the channel and who is allowed to receive from the channel. Yes. You could do that, that complicates my semantics a bit, but that's not uh, really a problem. I, tried, I, I avoid this here in order to keep things simple, but you can also guard them. Yes. <coughs> Other questions? No? Good. In the real language formula, actually, you can use guards. Yeah. Um, so now I'm going to show you that any channel system, so again, a channel system over a set of shared variables as well as channels, can be mapped onto a transition system. And we have seen already that uh, all these things, program graphs, sequential hardware circuits, multi-threading, everything can be boiled down to transition systems. The same holds for channel systems. So first of all, we have to agree on what are the states. Now, if you look at this system, what are the states? What do you need to know about this system in order to know what is the current state? Well, first and foremost, for every program graph, you need to know what's the current location. So you want to know that this program graph is maybe currently here. It's the local program counter, so to speak, of this program graph. Similarly, for this program graph, you want to know that this is the current location. Good. So the first thing you need is that for every process, you need to know the value of the, cur of the program counter, L1 up to Ln. What else do we need? <laughs> Well, we need to know what are the current values of the variables, x and y. So what are we going to do? We're going to add, like we did for program graphs, a function that maps every variable to its value. And then we have channels. 
and we also have a valuation of the channels. So we have to keep track of that maybe here is a message B and here are the message CAA and we have to keep track of this in the state and that's exactly what this function psi is doing over here. Okay, so states in my transition systems are those tuples, locations plus variable and channel valuations. <coughs> so this is what we, what we have as a state. And now the variable valuations have, as before for program graphs, is a mapping from the variables to all the domains of all the variables in my program graph. And the same for channels. This is a mapping from the channels to sequences, eh, finite words, that's what the star indicates. Over what? Well, over the type or the domain of all the channels we have. And if I have a channel of type integer and I have a, another channel of type string, then I take the union. I can both, this function maps the channel of type integers to integers, or sequences of integers, and the valuation of a channel of strings to a finite word of strings. There is one constraint. The constraint is that, of course, the valuation of channel C cannot carry more messages than its capacity. Good. Okay, so now we're going to define the transition relation. So we now know what are the states. Now we need to know how can we evolve from one state to another state. So we're going to do this by means of uh, 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 those structured operational semantics rules, those premise, a bar, and a conclusion, as we have seen before. So what are we going to do? First, if we have actions which are independent, we are treating them similarly as interleaving. That means the program graphs can execute autonomously. For instance, if this is going to modify x, then the program graph can evolve autonomously, like we did for interleaving of program graphs. That part does not change. The rules for the message passing, however, are the new ones, and that's the ones that we are, have to consider. So these are the ones for sending a message, receiving a message. So that we need to make much more precise. So the interleaving rule is very straightforward. Suppose that this is the current state of your channel system. We have n components, we have evaluation of the variables, evaluation of the channels. Now suppose that program graph i, the one here in the middle somewhere, is wants to, can do a certain action. That's indicated by the premise. The program graph i has an edge from location li to l prime i. It can do this guarded action with guard g and action alpha. The first thing that we need to check, is this guard enabled? How can we check whether this guard is enabled? Well, a guard is a Boolean condition over the variables. So we're going to check, like we did for program graphs, that this function eta, which is indicating the current valuation of all the variables, if that one satisfies the gut. So this means if this holds, this means this edge is enabled. Now we can take the edge. So now we have to describe what is the effect of taking the edge, and that's indicated here on the right-hand side. All processes remain at the same location, so L1 remains L1. Ln remains Ln, the same for L2. The only thing that is changing is this Li, according to this rule, evolves into Li prime. So that's indicated here by this Li prime. Then we can do action alpha. That corresponds to the action that this local, let's say, program I is performing. The channels are not affected because these actions, I mean, those are the guarded actions. We have agreed that the communication actions are not guarded. So this has no effect on the channel, so psi remains psi. But we have to, of course, define what is happening to the variables. So if this alpha tells you x becomes x plus 1, then you can imagine that in this valuation, I have to take this effect, and that's the same as we did for program graphs, x becomes x plus 1. Good, that's what I already said. Good, I hope this is not so much surprising because we have seen a similar thing for program graphs. So what about these uh, message passing? Again, I'm going to consider two cases, strictly positive capacity, zero capacity. Let's first look at the strictly positive capacity. So what happens if I receive a message? Okay, so this is the situation. 
Maybe I draw a diagram to make things more clear. We have a program graph i, which is in the location li. There is an edge to li prime. Yeah. And this is indicated here by c question mark x. C question mark x. Good. What do I know? Currently, this program graph is here. So that's the current value of the program counter. And um, for the rest, I know that the current content of C is V1 up to VK. So here is my channel C. Yeah. So this is channel C. Channel C has apparently the values uh, V1, V2, dot, 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 to VK. Good. And we know that uh, k is positive. That means that this string is non-empty. Your mailbox has at least one message. OK, now what is going to happen? So this is all what is written down in the premise and what is written down here. Now some action can happen. This action is labeled with some arbitrary label here. I used tall. I could have used any other symbol here. Uh, to indicate that we received a message. What's going to happen? What would you expect? Well, first and foremost, the program counter will move here, right? So we move from here to there, because the action is enabled, because the buffer is non-empty. For the rest, what's going to happen? Well, we are going to maybe change the valuation. Why is the valuation changed? Yeah, because I received something to x, right? So x has a certain value here, maybe 27. Now I'm going to assign to x a new value, namely the first value, which is at the head of the buffer. Yeah. So that's described as follows. So what we're going to say is that x, I mean the new valuation at a prime, is only affecting x. That's what the square brackets mean here. So this function eta, where x becomes v1 for any value y, equals eta y for any y difference from x. So this is basically saying every variable different from x is not changed. The second line tells you if y equals x, the new value of x is going to be v1. So this is going to be v1, which is exactly this value over here. If the value of y, for instance, here was, let's say, uh, the symbol uh, ab, then uh, y here is still ab. That's not going to change. What else is going to change? Well, the buffer. So that's indicated by this psi prime. What's the effect that we have to describe? We have to describe that this message is deleted from the buffer. And that's what exactly this function does. So this psi prime is only affecting channel C. Every other channel remains the same. And that's formalized as follows. So this psi function with the square bracket C becomes V2 to VK for any channel D is, well, if D differs from C, you take the old value because that channel has not been affected. And otherwise, we have to remove the value from the Q. So indeed, we have to remove V1. And therefore, you see, if D equals C, then we have the finite word V2 to VK as the new content of the buffer. And that means the head of the buffer is now basically pointing to this element. OK? Good. Any questions? Good. Seems to be clear. Good. What happens if I send a message? I hope this is not so much uh, now a uh, surprise. So again, I consider a scenario where uh, program graph I can send the message with value V to the channel C. <coughs> First, what do I need to check? I need to check that this channel has maybe some content, possibly empty. And what do I need to check? I need to check whether this action, sending a message, is enabled. When is the sending of a message enabled? If the buffer is not full. And that means that this k, k is the number of messages which is currently in the channel, needs to be strictly smaller than the capacity. Stated differently, there needs to be at least one free spot in your mailbox. Then what you can do is you do the sending. So that means that this program graph changes the program counter to li prime. All other program graphs are not affected. The variable valuation is not affected because we do not do any assignment to any of the shared variables. 
The only thing that changes is the channel. And what's ch changing to the channel? Well, only the channel C, because that's the channel we are affecting. All the remaining channels are not affected. And that means the new valuation is the same as the previous one, except that channel C gets a new content. What's the new content? Well, it's the old content, V1 to VK, and we append the new value V at the end. So we get V1 to VK, and we append the value V at the end of the buffer. Good. Um, yes? No, eta is not affected because uh, uh, eta is only a function that is uh, for the variables, yeah, and we don't change the variables. So this is different from receiving, because from receiving we change the value of x, so there also eta is changing. Yeah? But in sending, this is not changing. Other questions? No? Good. So what happens if the capacity is zero? Then we have handshaking. So what does that mean? If the channel is synchronous, which means capacity is zero, then sending and receiving need to be done simultaneously, like we have seen in the previous lecture. So now we have two program graphs, program graph I and program graph J. I is willing to receive a message, J is willing to send a message, both on channel C. So what's going to happen? Um, provided that both are in these locations, Li and Lj, where these two actions are enabled. Now the channel has capacity zero. We are going to handshake. So actually, the only enabled condition is that both processes, both program graphs, need to be able to one to send and the other one to receive at the same time. And this is guaranteed by this condition and that condition. So there is no condition with respect to the capacity of the channel. You cannot send a message to yourself in this model, so I needs to be different from J. And then what's going to happen? We have to modify eta. Why do we have to modify eta? Because the value of x is potentially going to change. x is going to be the value v. And maybe we're going to change something with uh, eta prime, because, I mean, this function here is going to be the same as eta, only the variable x is going to change, and uh, psi actually is not changing because the channel has capacity zero, so that we don't have to model the fact that we store this message in some sense. Good. This uh, can easily get uh, out of bounds, this transition system, so if you just have a channel system with two processes and two locations, two Boolean shared variables, or Boolean variables, and you have two channels of capacity 10, and let's, for the sake of simplicity, assume that they carry Boolean values, so only zeros and ones, so basically bit vectors. Then uh, the channel, uh, the transition system has already so many states. Um, we have two processes with two locations. Remember, we have as a state first the location of all the program graphs. We have four different values. Secondly, we have the function eta that tells you what are the potential possible values of these two Boolean variables. So we have two Boolean variables that can each have two different values. And then we have two channels. The channels can carry, uh, so this is the, 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 the two channels. So this is one channel, that's another channel. Um, and they each have capacity 10. And that means that they can carry strings from up to one le length one, length two, etc., up to length, uh, in the end, the val possible values of two to the power 10. So this is, I think, the empty channel. This is a channel of size 1 that can carry two different values, 0, 1. This is a channel of size 2, etc. Yeah. And the buffer can be partially filled, and therefore I have to consider all possibilities, and that's why you get 2 to the power 11 minus 1. And this is, of course, huge. Good. If you have an unbounded channel, I think this is clear. The number of states is unboundedly large, is infinite. So let's look at a very simple example to show you what you can do with these channel systems. <laughs> and uh, Gesundheit. This is uh, uh, the alternating bit protocol. So what's the alternating bit protocol? This is a simple version of it. We have two program graphs, a sender and a receiver. The idea is that the sender can send a message to the receiver, 
and the receiver is going to acknowledge the correct receipt of a message. So you send a message, you wait for the acknowledgement, then maybe you send the next message. If you don't get an acknowledgement on time, let's say, then you're going to repeat, so you're going to retransmit your message. In order to distinguish the original messages from the retransmissions, we're going to use a bit, and this bit is going to alternate. So it's either zero or one, and you submit first a message of zero. Suppose I wait for an acknowledgement, the acknowledgement doesn't come, then I repeat the message with the same bit, zero. If, however, I get an acknowledgement, then I'm going to flip my bit, and the next message will be accompanied with the bit one. Yeah, so I alternate the bit once I receive correctly an acknowledgement. Okay, so this is what happens in the channel. The channel from the sender to the receiver can carry messages plus this bit, which is indicated here as Y, which is the alternating bit that I just explained. And I'm assuming that this channel is unreliable in the following sense, messages may get lost. Yeah, so the sender sends a message plus a bit, boom, by some means the message is lost. This could happen, for instance, if the, the channel is something like a, a wireless channel or whatever, and there is some kind of problem in the communication. Then what the receiver does, the acknowledgement is simply means you, the receiver returns the bit it received. And that's basically the whole acknowledgement. So the channel from the sender to the receiver is just carrying Boolean variables. Now the only thing that we need to model is this kind of abstract timeout mechanism. I need to model when I'm I waiting for an acknowledgement and I gave up because it, I took too long. So I model this by means of an abstract process, which I call a sender. So we have three program graphs here, a sender, receiver, plus a timer. So basically this is the rough description of the protocol. It's an infinite loop that basically sends a message plus a bit. You activate the timer. If a timeout occurs, then you resend the message with the same bit and you activate the timer again. If you receive an acknowledgement, then you turn off the timer and you toggle the bit. Y becomes not Y. Good. I'm assuming here for the sake of simplicity that this acknowledgement channel is reliable. That means if the receiver sends as acknowledgement the bit Y, it will be received by the sender. So for the sake of simplicity, I'm assuming that that channel is not unreliable. Good. If both channels are unreliable, yeah, then you need to equip your model with an extra timer here that says something like, I have received this, and now I can also acknowledge from the other side. So this is not what I'm going to consider. Good. So the model that I'm going to I try to model this by means of the channel system. So the channel system has a sender, a timer, and a receiver. There are two channels, the unreliable channel C, and I'm going to assume the reliable channel D. C is directed from the sender to the receiver, D is directed in the reverse direction. Good. Now I'm going to assume that also the sender communicates with the timer. How I'm going to do this? I'm going to assume that this happens by means of a channel of capacity zero. So there is a synchronous message passing between the timer and the sender. These buffers, C and D, they have a positive capacity. That means they, they basically exchange messages in an asynchronous manner. I call these channels E and F, so they have capacity zero. D and C have a positive capacity. Good, so let me first explain you what's the program graph of the timer, then we're going to see the program graph of the sender, the receiver, and then we're going to see how these things work together. So the timer is a very simple process. It has two locations, off and on. And there are only actions in which it can communicate. So initially it's off, and then it waits, yeah, basically along channel E from the sender, well, you need to start Z. I'm going to start my timer. Now you're here. Either the timer is switched off by the sender, I receive an acknowledgement on time, 
then I can switch off the timer. This corresponds to this edge over here. Or the timer can spontaneously generate a timeout. Now, I'm not modeling in this model because it's not um, equipped for doing this to say that this happens after 20 seconds or after two hours. I just assume that non-deterministically in this on location, the timer spontaneously can send a timeout over channel F to the sender. Yeah, so the sender sends a message. It switches on the timer. The sender waits for an acknowledgement. Either it gets the acknowledgement on time, it says it to the timer, please switch off. Or the timer spontaneously says, uh-uh, I give you a timeout. Timeout means you're going to retransmit. Now, I'm fully aware of the fact that this is not a realistic model because the timeout may happen now very often. This simply means for the protocol that I'm going to retransmit my message more than necessary. For the correctness of the protocol, this is not so relevant. And not so relevant is, means not relevant. OK. What uh, the timer is doing, the timer can, as I explained, it can switch on the timer, it can switch off the timer, or it can wait for a timeout. <laughs> e and F are channels of capacity zero. That means if the timer switch can, uh, is in the off location, and the sender is at the location where it wants to do this action, then they move simultaneously. The timer moves to the on state. The sender moves to its next action. Yeah. Capacity, zero. Good. Now we're going to specify the sender. So now I'm going to specify this whole mechanism of toggling the bit, waiting for an acknowledgement. If a timeout occurs, you have to do the retransmission. And I do this by means of a program graph. So the sender is the most complicated procedure. Why is this? Because the sender communicates in a synchronous manner with the timer via E and via F. And it also communicates with the sender by sending messages over C and receiving acknowledgments over D. So it interacts with four channels, two of them being synchronous, two of them being asynchronous. Good. So the synchronous things we already have seen, you either send a timeout or you just uh, receive timer on and timer off. So these are just the synchronization channels or the synchronization signals between the sender and the timer. And what I'm going to use is I'm going to use a Boolean variable x for the acknowledgement bit that is sent by the receiver. So if this sender receives via D a bit that is the acknowledgement bit of the receiver, it can store this locally by a variable which I call here x. Good. So let's look. This is the program graph of the sender. Now, the first thing that is hopefully clear, I have to distinguish between whether the current bit is 0 or whether the current bit is 1. The two scenarios will be completely symmetric. So I will have on the left-hand side something happening with 0. On the right-hand side, we will have something happening with 1. So the first thing is that we generate a message. And the first thing that we want to do is we want to try to send message 0. What does that mean? It means. I want to put in the channel C the message 0. OK, so now the sender has sent, OK, here is your message. Actually, the message has content empty. I only send the bit for the sake of simplicity. So I only tell you, hey, there is a 0. Now, remember, I have to wait for an acknowledgement. So the first thing I need to do is I have to activate the timer. How do I activate the timer? I synchronize over uh, basically a channel. Now, I model the fact that the channel can lose a message by, by already modeling here in the sender that there is this as action lost. So this means you try to send 0. Either you put the message 0 into the channel, or the message is lost. Good. Now I turn on the timer. I switch on the timer. I wait. There are two possibilities. Either the timeout occurs. Remember, this timer can spontaneously give a timeout. This corresponds to this edge over here. What am I going to do then? Then I'm going to do a retransmission. The retransmission is treated like the original transmission. Either it's lost or it is put into the channel. Now you are in this location. So the other possibility is not to do a timeout, but to receive the acknowledgment. So that means you receive the acknowledgment on time. 
That means along channel D, I'm going to receive message X. So, well, I'm not going to receive message X. I'm going to receive a bit which I'm going to store in the value X. Now I need to check whether the acknowledgement I received is the acknowledgement that I am waiting for. If I submit a message with bit 0, I am waiting for an acknowledgement with bit 0. That means if the acknowledgement which is currently stored in the variable x equals 1, I apparently received an acknowledgement which is not the one that I'm waiting for. So I go back to the location where I basically continue waiting for the bit that I was waiting for, 0. Okay? Good. Any questions on the left part of the program graph? No? So what happens if we have completed the whole transmission for 0? We go to the scenario for 1. So that's here on the right. So suppose that x equals 0, so, so that means we were waiting for the bit 0, we get the acknowledgement for 0, so we can send the next message. So first is we switch off the timer. This timer was still running, right? We switched it on when we started this transmission, we now received the correct bit, so the first thing I do, switch off the timer. And I'm going to send a message with now value 1. And this is now going to be symmetric to the left pillar, those five program uh, locations. So this means that basically we get very similarly, I now try to send one, either the message is lost or I send the one, I activate the timer, so I switch on the timer, either the timeout occurs, which means I do a retransmission of value one. If I am waiting for the acknowledgement of message one and the acknowledgement comes, I store it in the variable x, I'm going to check whether x is the right value, if x equals zero, then this is not the right value because I'm waiting for the acknowledgement value one, not for zero. If, however, the value equals 1, I go back to this location and I switch off the timer. This is completely symmetric to the scenario we have seen on the left. Okay? So what did we see? We saw a timer, a sender, and now what is left is the receiver. So the receiver is modeled here. So the receiver is similar as the sender, symmetric. It waits for a message with bit 0, or it waits for a message of bit 1. You wait for a message. So this process is simply waiting for a message to be received via C. So it waits for this message along C, and it stores it in the local variable Y. Good. Now you are waiting for the message with bit 0. So you're going to check in this location whether Y is 1, that means that's bad because then I received a message which is not the one that I was waiting for, so I go back. Or I received the right message, which means zero, and now it means I can acknowledge, right? Because I received a zero, I was waiting for zero, so let's acknowledge. What does it mean to acknowledge? I submit along this channel the value zero. Why zero? Well, that was just the value I just received. So I acknowledge to the sender, hey, listen, I just have received value zero. Then it moves to this location because from then on it's going to wait for a message one. And then the scenario is symmetric. Good. So here you see an example of a channel system where I have a timer, a sender, and a receiver. And now we can maybe see what's going to happen. So here I have a very, try to squeeze this all in one slide. This is the sender. This was the timer, remember only two state, two locations, and this is the receiver, receive zero, receive one, and similarly the, by the sender, send zero and send one. The red edges means you lose a message, all the other ones are accordingly to the scheme as we had before. And now let's look at one possible scenario. So the first possible scenario is that we all, initially where do we start? Well, initially it's clear all the program graphs start in their initial location. So we start in the gray indicated locations. What are the current values of the channels? The default assumption is the channels are initially empty. That's indicated as follows. The channel C is empty and the channel D is empty. Now we 
the sender starts generating a message, so it evolves to S0. Nothing changes with respect to the channels yet. It only has generated the message 0. So the only thing that changed is that this one moved to here. So that's the current location. <laughs> now let's suppose the message is lost. OK, so that means S0 becomes T0. Yeah. So we move here. We go to this thing, and now we turn on the timer. So we are in this location, which is indicated here, a timer on zero. This T is just a shorthand for timer on. And nothing changed to the timer, nothing changed to the receiver, nothing changed to the channels yet. Now we turn on the sender, uh, the, sorry, the timer. So this was the synchronous communication between the sender and the timer. So that one evolves from this location to that location, and simultaneously, this one goes from the off to the on location. So that's what exactly happens here. Now, the message was lost. So this process is waiting for an acknowledgment that's never going to come. Um, so what's going to happen? At some point, a timeout is going to happen. OK? So at some point, the timeout is going to happen. What does that mean? It means, again, a synchronous communication, maybe back, a synchronous communication between the sender and the timer. The timer does a timeout, so it moves back to the off location, and this one goes back to the S0 location. It tries to do a retransmission. Synchronous communication, channel is zero, capacity, so this evolves simultaneously. That means we're going to try again. So this is the scenario. Another scenario. Here is uh, empty, we go there. Now the message is not lost, but sent. So I do the retransmission, now it's going to be sent. That means I'm going to switch on the timer. The timer and the sender evolve simultaneously. This is happening here. Now I wait for the acknowledgement. Let's assume that despite the fact that this message has been sent correctly, still the timer says, uh-uh, I have to wait too long, time out. So I go back, I do a retransmission. Ah, what does that mean? There are two zeros now in the channel C. The original one and the retransmission. Yeah? So that's what you see here. C has two zeros. The original one, which is at the head, and the new one, which is the retransmission, which is the second one. Uh, no acknowledgments have been sent so far. Let's assume now that the message is received. What does that mean? Well, maybe this was a bit too quick. But now this one, this edge is enabled because this one is waiting on message C to receive a message. The C is not empty, so it can receive a message. So it evolves there, and it removes the first zero from the channel. So the current channel valuation is a zero. Yeah. It receives this message, and it sends an acknowledgement. Why? Yeah, because it has received the first zero. So let's send an acknowledgement. What does that mean? It moves to this location. Um, it, uh, it moves to the A0 location. That means it's going to check whether it has the right value. And now we're going to send the acknowledgement via D. And that means send acknowledgement via D. That's where we were. And that means that currently the, ch the channel C has the 0, which was the retransmitted 0. And D has the 0, which was the acknowledgement to the original 0. Yeah? I hope you can still follow what's going on. Yeah, you're still on spoken terms? OK, fine. Well, so this is the current situation. Um, the sender is, uh, is uh, basically uh, is still here. Uh, the timer is off. Um, uh, that cannot be the case. Yeah, the timer is off. Uh, indeed, and uh, this one, this receiver is now waiting for message one. Yeah. Aha, but that's not the message it's going to get. It's going to get this bloody zero because that was a retransmitted thing because the sender thought, ah, something went wrong, so I'll retransmit. The receiver said, well, I received the first message and now I get another zero. So what happens is uh, we get this. The sender receiver reads the same message again. Yeah, it's here. It's waiting for a message, so let's get this message. Yeah. Now it's going to check, is this the message I'm waiting for? No, so it's waiting for this zero. It's waiting for a one, sorry. It's taking this zero. It's removing the zero from the channel. 
it receives the message, and now it says, ah, but that's not the message I was waiting for. Yeah. So what happens? Actually, it goes from here, I hope, back there. Yeah? Because it says, I, I received an acknowledgement. I received a message zero, but I already acknowledged the zero. So I'm not going to acknowledge this again. Yeah? Good. So I hope you understand that this alternating bit thing is important to distinguish between retransmissions of messages that you have already acknowledged or transmissions of new messages. Yeah? Good. And that is, you can continue. So I hope you get some feeling that this channel system can do. And I hope you get some feeling that you can use, actually model, um, yeah, communication protocols. And this is a very simple example, alternating bit protocol, but by means of those channel systems. And actually, the original model checker by, uh, by Holtzman, it was called SPIN. Um, it was originally called, uh, not SPIN, but it was originally called PAN. So the very first paper, I think somewhere eight, late 80s, was called PAN. And PAN stands for Protocol Analyzer. So the very on original aim of the model checker spin was to prove, or basically not prove, but model check, to so verify the correctness of communication protocols. Yeah. And that's why this language of, uh, of, uh, of spin has these primitives like channels, sending a message over channel, receiving a message over channel, and so forth. Yeah. Good. Uh, the number of states of the transition system is enormous. Yeah, I mean, what we have seen is basically the program graphs. I did not even dare to draw the transition system. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, how do I get to the 10? Well, 10 is the number of locations in the sender. Two is the number of locations of the timer. Six is the number of locations in the, in the receiver. And then I have the number of channel evaluations, and I think I even have to count X and Y, which are bit variables, but that's a small factor. I think I even admitted this. But that means uh, a lot. Yeah. So if you go back to the literature in, uh, in, um, in model checking, then uh, one of the main things is, is what's the largest model that you can still verify? Yeah? So for which capacity of the channels here can you still do verification of the alternating bit protocol? And this is what have people been working on quite a bit uh, and use this example as a benchmark actually to, um, to show scalability or non-scalability. Depends on your view. Okay, this was a question that was already posed before. Can you equip uh, those uh, things with guards? So here is a, what I call conditional communication actions. So here you can say, well, only if the guard holds, then you can receive from the message from C. So this guard, again, could be something like a condition over the global variables. That's possible. There are other variations. If you don't like to send only uh, receive this, but you, only you don't want to only send values, but you also want to send something like expressions, then this means you send to the channel C two times the current value of x plus 7. This is also possible. Uh, I did not introduce this, but this, the rules I explained to you are very easily extendable to these kind of things. It's not really a technical obstacle here. You can have conditions as uh, uh, communications. So you can do action alpha only if channel C has at least one message. And I even store this message in X. Yeah, so you can write down things down like this. And this is sometimes helpful in, uh, in communication protocols. So you can write down something like this. Uh, you can go from L uh, to here, and then you can say uh, C, question mark X. And then you say, OK, action uh, X becomes uh, two times X. Yeah? This is possible. What does that mean? I receive from over channel C the value of X. This is something determined by the sender. Right, so I don't have control myself over what this value is. The only thing I'm doing here, I want to double it. Yeah. So this is saying you can double x only if 
you receive if you can now receive x via the channel C. Yeah, so basically, this is doing two things in one shot. This is also not a technical pro problem. Uh, and this gives rise to some more compact transition system representations because you can model this in one, uh, one transition in, in effect. Um, in my case, the channel systems are what I call closed. All the channels are between program graphs. Now, you can imagine that you only specify a fragment of the system that communicates with the outside world, something that you do not consider in your own model. This is what people call open channel systems. And that simply means that I have a channel that comes from somewhere, and I can receive messages over this channel, but I don't know where somewhere is. Yeah. This is also possible. So this is uh, represented like this. So you have, uh, this was the situation before. You have program graphs and you have channels between them. But maybe P1 can receive messages from the outside world via D1. Then the sender is not explicitly part of your model, but is part of the context of your system. Yeah. Good. OK, um, before I summarize, I would like to uh, give you a short uh, uh, intuition about why these channel systems are important. And uh, what I want to introduce is uh, what I call uh, nano promola. So promola is the input language of uh, spin. So if you want to run the model checker spin, you have to provide models that are written down in this language. It's nano because I only consider a very small fragment. This language is much richer. And I only want to concentrate on the thing uh, that I would like to call. So what's a Promola program? A Promola program is actually, in our case, nothing else. This P bar is something like this. It's uh, P1 Pn. And uh, what are these processes? So this is called a process in Promola. So this is as follows. It's defined by means of statements. So what's the statement? So let's define the statement by means of the usual grammar notation, Bakker's Nau form. You can do nothing, which means skip. Uh, you can do things like excitements. X becomes the value of an expression. You have this notation as part of the language. Here you actually have C exclamation mark expressions. So far I was only using values, but that's uh, what is in this language. Uh, I can do concatenation, so I do statement followed by statement. I can do atomic. And in this atomic, I can do assignments. So something like x1 becomes expression 1, dot, 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 xn becomes expression n. Uh, I use this atomic uh, in Peterson's mutual exclusion algorithm. And this is actually uh, a first class citizen in the, in the Promola language. What else is there? There are if statements and there are while and there are do statements. So if dot dot uh, g1 statement one uh, dot 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 gk uh, statement k, and then you have something like see under underlined means there are keywords in the language, and then you have similarly you have do. So maybe let me So you have the same for loops and Promola does it as follows do and then similar like here you have a G1 statement 1 dot 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 gk uh, statement k alt yeah so this is basically the syntax um, of this language um, two remarks about the semantics 
So what is the semantics? The semantics is as follows. The idea is that you take a Promola program You map this to a channel system. I have a few remarks, but I hope it's pretty clear that this is basically nothing else than something like a syntactic notation of the channel systems we have just introduced. And then we have seen that every channel system is a transition system. So a user of a model checker describes models here at this level. Yeah. And then there is a compiler, basically an automated state generation that generates for you the transition system. And what we are going to do, we are going to apply the model checking algorithms on this level on transition systems. Yeah, but where they originally come from, they come from here. Yeah. Good. Two remarks about this semantics. One. It's what they call a test and set semantics. What do I mean by this? So this means that uh, the evaluation of the guard plus selection of an enabled guard plus execution of first atomic statement of selected guard. This together is one, um, one edge in the program graph. Yeah, so suppose I have something like this, if C, and then I say, okay, if X is larger than zero, then I do atomic, I don't know what, uh, X plus plus, and uh, y becomes zero, yeah? And then maybe I do something else, uh, maybe I double x, yeah? And here is something like uh, x uh, at most zero, and then I do something else. Now let's suppose x equals zero. The first thing you see, both guards are enabled. This is fully fine in Promola. The question is which guard are we going to pick? Non-deterministically, we're going to pick one of them. So maybe we pick the first one. Then what this means, what I wrote down here as test semantics, test and set semantics, we're going to test whether x equals zero, whether this guard is true, it's true. We're going to test whether this guard is true, it's also true. So we have determined this for all the guards, maybe there are more here. So now we know which statements are enabled. Now we pick one. How? Non-deterministically, we pick the first one. Then we're going to execute this thing, and this all together is one step. Yeah, in the program graph, this is modeled as follows. So you have a location in the program graph, and depending on this location of this program graph, maybe of the channels, etc. And then there is one edge that basically says x at least zero, and then what you are going to do is uh, x plus plus, and y becomes zero and then you move here. <coughs> maybe here there are other enabled edges, right? So maybe here is the edge x at most, zero, etc. And what I mean is that this is one step. It cannot be interleaved with steps of other programs. Yeah? Good. What else do you need to know? Um, suppose that I have, uh, so that's the second one, what I call the blocking semantics. And that's maybe the last remark about Promola. What does that mean? Maybe I do this by means of an example. Okay. 
suppose you have something like this, an if, and then you say, OK, if x is larger than 10, uh, then I do whatever, atomic something. Or uh, if x is uh, less than 4, then I do this. Okay, these guards are not exclusive. So what happens if I now have a location uh, where I, my program counter is about to execute this if statement and the value of x, so eta of x, is uh, between uh, 4 and 10? I don't know, 7. What does that mean? It means you enter this if statement, none of the guards is enabled. The blocking semantics is you start waiting here. Why? Well, x is a shared variable, so x can be changed maybe from another process. Yeah. And that means you're going to wait until at some point, and you may wait at infinitum in principle, but as soon as this value of x becomes either larger than 10 or less than 4, you can continue. Yeah. So basically this means wait until x is larger than 10 or x is smaller than 4. Yeah. This only applies to if and phi, not to do, do and odd, not to loops, but only to these if statements. Good. So that means if you want to model Peterson's algorithm in Promola, remember this was his mutual exclusion algorithm we have seen last time, then this is modeled as follows, do, true, and then you can do something like a skip, which we meant last time as something like doing nothing non-critical. And then you do atomic, b1 becomes true, uh, x becomes 2, now maybe you remember that Peterson's algorithm had those local variables uh, b1 and b2 and a shared variable x, right? And last lecture we have seen it is very important to put this atomically because otherwise, and if you swap those two things and do not do it atomically, you don't guarantee mutual exclusion. Actually, it's very easy to check this. Uh, model this in Promola, put it into spin and it will tell you uh, you violate. Yeah, so that's easy. Um, then you say if, um, x equals 1 or not b2, then enter the critical section. I model this here by crit 1 becomes true. And then uh, I think I need to put a phi or something like this. Yeah. And then you do atomic crit 1 becomes false. So I model here explicitly whether I'm in the critical section or I'm leaving it, and then I should set b1 to false 2, and here is odd. So maybe if you go back to the slides of the previous lectures here, it was saying wait until this or this holds. You don't have to write this wait until because this is the blocking semantics of if. If you are in this if statement and this guard is violated, you're just stuck here. That means you are waiting until the guard becomes true, and then you can continue. OK. This concludes um, everything about modeling. Um, the idea is that you model your system at a high level of description. Promola, if people, if you like Petronets more, you do it in Petronets. If you like synchronous hardware, you model it as synchronous hardware. Um, the point is, at the end, what you get is a transition system. Yeah. In the next lectures, and uh, what we have seen is several ways to do parallel operators that I already explained in the beginning of the lecture. What is important is this model over here that basically covers everything that we have seen before. Program graphs, synchronous communication, shared variables, asynchronous communication. Um, and um, in the end, what you do is you do the model checking on the transition system. Starting from next week, on Tuesday there is a bank holiday, at least in Germany. So there is no lecture on Tuesday. 
The next lecture will be on Friday, and there we will start about properties, because the second ingredient of model checking is what is the property you would like to check. Okay, hope to see you next week. Have a nice weekend.